Hi, everyone. Um, so prior to our official meeting this evening, we're about to have our first pre-meeting program of the year. Uh, before I turn things over, I want to thank our first vice chair, Rachel Glass, for developing this program. Um, with a confirmed appointment, Rachel will be our program's chair for this term. And I'm also looking forward to seeing more local and community-based programs in the months ahead. Um, we're hoping to bring programming that gives us greater insights into organizations in the community and also uh, provide our partner organizations opportunity to learn more about the 34th. Um, so if you're interested in developing and supporting our programs, I encourage you to reach out to Rachel. And I'm pleased that this evening, we're able to put a spotlight on an organization based here in the 34th um, that is focused on addressing poverty in Washington state. So now without further ado, I'm gonna turn things over to Rachel. Thanks, Graham. Um, I would like to uh, hop right into the program today. Our special guest, Malachi Kane, is uh, the executive director of Africatown International. He has served at that position since the formation of the organization in 2013. Prior to that, he served as general counsel representing the organization and Black families on the Seattle Public Schools SPS, African American Community Partnerships Task Force, um, under then Superintendent Jose Banda. And although the goals of the task force were accomplished, it was obvious that there was more work to be done in the area of stabilizing families, um, which is why Malachi continues on with this important work. I'm going to let him uh, give you much more information and details. So without further ado, let us give a warm 34th Dems neighborly welcome to our neighbor, Malachi Kane. Hello all, uh, great to be here. Uh, it's a pleasure to be invited and I, I really cherish the opportunity. Um, and Rachel reading the bio that they wrote some time ago, it just sounds, uh, sounds great. Um, thank you. Um, as she uh, explained, I am the executive director of Africatown International. Uh, we did get our start off in the educational uh, realm, uh, just trying to tap into some uh, successes with some of the disparities and other problems that we had observed with our students as parents with students in SPS, uh, meaning there was disproportionate uh, suspension and expulsion rates uh, for black male students. Uh, there was some significant uh, educational shortcomings and other things. Uh, we voiced our concerns uh, and uh, eventually got a task force uh, and were able to address some of the issues um, far from, from being over or resolved. Um, after doing the work for a couple of years, it became obvious and evident uh, that a lot of our students were experiencing homelessness. Uh, so it was kind of hard or difficult to speak to parents about uh, grades and other things when just the basic necessities of life, uh, their housing, you know, and, and things, of, uh, you know, around that uh, area were being jeopardized by you know, uh, rent being uh, uh, raised, um, you know, district redistricting and other things that were taking place. Uh, and so more and more education, although at the forefront of our uh, desired success, uh, more so we were just trying to keep our families stably housed. Uh, we're still in that struggle at this point in time right now. Uh, Right now, our organization manages the Centralized Diversion Fund. Uh, this is a fund, uh, private and publicly funded. Uh, last year, I believe we were at around uh, five, around five million. Um, we have a partnership with Jeff Bezos uh, and uh, City of Seattle and King County in general. Um, primarily, what we are doing is providing emergency funding uh, for families working families, that is, and households uh, that are about to fall through the cracks and uh, preventing them from being evicted. Uh, so this in itself uh, is rewarding work, but it is never ending. 
and you have to be tireless to really engage this because um, when we say homelessness, first thing you think of usually is is the you know the guy under the bridge with the cardboard box and this and that. Um, but you have to keep in mind, you know, there are thousands of working families who cannot take the rent hikes uh, and who become unstabilized due to, you know, family emergencies, deaths in the family, domestic violence, um, the house is going to be demolished so they can build condos, all of these type of scenarios we see on a day-to-day -day basis. And literally, we will see families that are living in their car, mom and dad, going to work, dropping kids off of school, taking showers in parks or the Y or something of this nature. Uh, they need to be uh, uh, rehoused. Uh, they just can't come up with seven, eight, nine, ten thousand dollars in some instances to move into the family home, uh, you know, which is also a scarcity at this point in time. Uh, just finding a two, three, four bedroom house for a family in the city of Seattle is also very challenging. Um, aside from that, you'll see families that have credit issues or prior evictions. Uh, this bars them from moving into households. So although you may have two checks or paychecks in a household or one, um, still it's impossible for just the average uh, applicant to amass the amount of money necessary uh, to move in uh, to a comfortable home, stabilize it and pay rent and continue on with day-to-day -day life. So this is where we come in. We have several programs, uh, a move-in program, uh, a credit restoration program uh, that allows families that have bad credit and things on their uh, uh, background checks to be able to uh, move in. We have several uh, community partners, Housing Connector, as I said, King County, City of Seattle, um, and over 240 of the local agencies that work on homelessness prevention are able to tap into the centralized diversion fund and uh, source uh, re, uh, resources for their clients as well uh, to remain or become stably housed. So that's the primary focus of our work uh, in the region right now. And as I said, it was diverted from the educational field simply because of necessity. Um, there was no um, excuse or anything we could offer our parents uh, when they needed housing and we were trying to direct them to, you know, push for, you know, uh, better educational uh, environments. But, you know, people were telling me, hey, we're going to be on the streets. You know, we don't even know if we're going to school or where we're going to be. So that's why we diverted our uh, energy and, and resources to the homelessness prevention and diversion uh, through the Centralized Diversion Fund. So um, that's just a little bit of background. Um, I'll give you a little more. A lot of people ask us, you know, what is Africa Town? What, what, what does it mean? What is it? Is it a place? Is it a, you know, uh, some type of uh, play on Chinatown or Japantown or Germantown? What, what is it? You know, um, and my answer is very uh, simple. Um, I don't know. Okay, hold on. Let me see if I can get uh, to sh share my screen. Is that available as an option yet? Yes, it is. Okay. Can everyone see my screen? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. I guess I'm the host. I have to admit people. Is that correct? I have to admit. Is, is there someone in the waiting room? There was. I just admitted them. I was wait. I was going to say, hey, you guys let the, uh, someone in. And then um, I just clicked them in. Thank so, you. All right. Um, can everyone see that? Is it large enough or should we go bigger? How's that? Great. Okay. Uh, Africa Town, the physical location uh, is a place in Mobile, Alabama. Uh, it was founded in 1861, 6061. Um, this is the final resting place of the last uh, voyagers on the last slave ship to enter U.S. waters and be uh, pulled into the United States, uh, continental United States. 
There were 110 passengers on board. Uh, the ship sailed and captured the uh, individuals from Africa and returned from uh, Africa with full cargo, all the people on board. Um, and this was allegedly because of a wager or a bet that the ship owner, who was a wealthy landowner at the time, had made with one of his uh, compatriots. Uh, you know, just a, a drunken bet with a friend that, hey, I've got this boat. And although uh, human trafficking and transatlantic human trafficking has been outlawed, I can make it with my boat back to the States with a full load. Um, after the abolition of slavery, uh, you know, there was an economic crunch among some of the more wealthy and uh, uh, production-based uh, uh, individuals and companies for cheap or free labor. So there was always this, this push to, uh, you know, reinvent slavery, call it something else, allow it for this or that, but uh, the federal government, as it were, just was totally against it and it was outlawed. However, uh, the ship did return with, as I said, uh, 110 men and women and children on board, uh, and it was uh, apprehended by the government. Uh, the people were released, and uh, although there was no criminal charges or anything like that, uh, they were simply freed and left there in Mobile, Alabama. Uh, their first request you know, and I, I tell this to people so they can really get a grasp and an understanding of, you know, the reality of, 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 of this scenario that happens. You get kidnapped, drug halfway across the world, you know, and in this day and age and in, in, in our studies, especially now in Black History Month, you know, we've always studied about the civil rights movement and people wanting or, or uh, demanding, you know, rights or justice or this or that. And it's always important for us to really understand when these people got off the, the, the ship, you know, they didn't ask for health care or housing or justice or, or, or to be free or any of that. They asked to go home, you know, and this was something that was never facilitated or could not be facilitated. Even in this event here, where the government themselves said, hey, these people have done something illegal and wrong. As far as we're concerned, you're free to go. And they're like, go where? You know, um, so from the onset, uh, this has been the uh, case or scenario for a lot of the African Americans, both slaved and en enslaved and those that never suffered slavery as well. Just the housing situation. Where do I live? How do I make my living? You know, where can I be comfortable and just raise my family and get on with my life? And still today, as I just explained, uh, we're still experiencing that. So um, I, I did share my uh, presentation and it's short and sweet. Um, and I say that because, you know, uh, Black History Month is something I've celebrated uh, I don't know if I, I don't know if celebrate is the correct word. Um, I will say this, okay, I, I was, uh, I did my early schooling, elementary and otherwise some of it uh, in Arizona, and that would have been during the 70s. So I don't know if anyone's familiar with, with that picture, what that looks like, but uh, Arizona maybe, 0.5% Black at that time, um, you know, and still even into my teenage years, vehemently opposed to um, Martin Luther King Day. I, I think you, everyone remembers that because they kind of highly publicized that, you know, that, that Arizona did not as a state want to adopt the federal holiday of Martin Luther King Day. And uh, before that, you know, there was a large push for different uh, Afrocentric or, you know, African-American based holidays or, or celebrations. Um, to me, it was always a traumatic uh, experience um, for one or two reasons. You know, sometimes I would be 
the only black person in a class. And, you know, then this issue would come up and then the tension would mount and build. And it was like, jump up on the mic and say something, you know, and it was like, uh, you know, so I had that experience. Um, you know, as I said, that was during the 70s. Uh, and I went back and forth between my mother and father who had divorced uh, in the early 70s, uh, shortly after I was born. Uh, my father's family was from uh, Kansas City, Missouri. I don't know if you're familiar with that as well. So um, in my transition of doing school and having the experience of being the only uh, Black person in class, I would then transition sometimes to a school where the entire school was Black. Okay, and I mean the principal, the teacher, the janitor, um, everyone, all the students. And therein again, um, you know, having just had this experience in this other scenario uh, with Black History Month or, or the, you know, proposed holiday or whatever, I would go to this environment and it was quite the opposite, but it was like no one was taking it seriously, you know, and everyone had this, this you know, uh, ridiculing, you know, type situation. And the fact that I was fair skinned uh, in these environments, you know, oftentimes I would be, we'd have a school play and they would say, hey, you know, why don't you play the, the, the slave master? Master or or the the white guy or this and that or that and that you know what I'm saying it would be like oh you know what I mean so again it was never something that uh, was um, celebrated I guess you would say and I I hope I've explained the dynamics of uh, of the actual events but let me say this just in itself it's traumatic. Because when you say Black History Month or you know, any type of historical context of African America, the first thing you think, you know, oh, okay, well, Martin Luther King. Or, you know, maybe you have a different orientation. You say Malcolm X, or you say civil rights movement. And for a person that uh, is vested in that uh, from their family or their community. That means, okay, Martin Luther King, you know, a leader, a beloved leader, shot and killed. Malcolm X, another beloved leader, shot and killed. And we go on and on and on from there, from dogs and water hoses, this, this, and that, and this, and that. So again, this, this can be a, a, a traumatic event. And I think to get through it, um, firstly, uh, we have to just approach it from a logical perspective. You know, and that is dissecting what really happened, what happened to us, because uh, as the inheritors of the 20th century and everything that came before it, uh, you know, oftentimes we're, we're left holding a, a tremendous weight that we're expected to carry and deal with. Um, and by no fault of our own, we don't have all the answers. So like I said, a logical approach and just finding some of those answers, working our way through it, um, and, 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 and realistically looking at the problems and trying to find solutions together. Because no matter what your position is, we're in it together. And we've always been in it together. That's an important point. So getting beyond my trauma, I hope I didn't uh, re-traumatize anybody or offend anybody. Um, and uh, I have a quote about that. I'll, I'll say share it in a minute. Uh, raised hand is that official or Chris? Are you trying to raise your hand? So, uh, Chris, if I could just uh add in, we're going to have a, t a question and answer time at the end. So, if if ever anyone has a question, please uh hold till the last uh. 15 minutes or so of the program and, and we'll have Malachi do Q&A and can answer any questions or any thoughts that anyone want to uh, wants to add in. True, I, I love to answer questions and uh, yeah, just please hold them. And if I say anything offensive, uh, 
just let me know. Hold on to it. Don't get angry or whatever, because we'll deal with it. <laughs> um, so uh, this was a picture, you know, and they always told us this, and we believe it, most of us, that pictures speak louder than words. Um, and uh, I, I often, I look at this picture. This is the wallpaper on my computer and my iPad. And I just look at the picture in their faces. I'm trying to envision, you know, what I could do in my life to where you said, take a picture. And then this was how I looked. Um, it's uh, mainly women. And this is a plantation. Um, I've done as much research as I could on it. Um, and, uh, you know, like I said, the picture speaks for itself. Um, there are some people there that are, you know, I'm going to persevere and work through this. Other people are in a total state of misery. Uh, some people are confused. Some people are just dead tired. The old, the young mothers next to their daughters, next to their granddaughters. It's all there. And like I said, I just try to work my way through it. And from that standpoint, uh, up to this day, you know, and the reason I do that, um, I'm someone that studied uh, epigenetics um, and, and generational trauma. And epigenetics is just the, the uh, scientific or biological terminology for uh, you know, emotional states being passed down through generations, passed from mother to child, mother to son. And a lot of us are, are, are conditioned to say or believe or think um, that happened, you know, 100 years ago or 200 years ago. You need to get over this. You need to stop. You need to stop, you know, uh, playing victim or seeking victimhood and this and this and that. And I don't think it's that a lot of times there may be someone that cannot articulate what they're feeling, but definitely um, as, as science has progressed and we see that there is transgenerational trauma and um, you know, if you don't deal with it, it's going to manifest itself into a negative uh, 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 reaction at some point in time. So I look at this picture and I wanted you all to see it as well um, and just see what, what they're feeling, you know? And this is, this is what's manifesting in the streets today, in the world, in, the, in our communities today. And I am not under any delusions and I'm not going to promote any to you all. Um, I think uh, as African-Americans, we are in a state of emergency. And I'm not going to limit it to African Americans because I think as Americans, we're in a state of emergency. Um, you know, and it reminds me of a story uh, or uh, a, an oral tradition, I'll say that, that was passed down uh, from Africa that, that I had received some years ago. Um, and it, it relates to uh, a, a boat, a multi level ship that had sailed. And uh, the upper class passengers were allowed to stay on the top deck uh, in the sun and in the fresh air. And the lower class or more impoverished people were escorted to the underbelly of the ship. Uh, and they, you know, in the, in, 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 uh, the ancient times or older times, a, a, a ship or a vessel may sail for 30 to 90 days, you know. So anyway, the ship takes sail and uh, the passengers that are on the upper decks are enjoying, you know, the sun and the fresh air and the best food and, you know, they're having a great time. And the people under, in the underbelly of the ship, they're having a horrible time. It smells down there. It's filthy. It's dark. Uh, they have to knock on the top to get permission to go up to get supplies or, you know, fresh water, things of that nature. So someone under the bottom of the ship uh, gets the bright idea that, you know what, I'm going to take this axe and I'm going to knock a hole in the bottom of the ship, just a small hole to where I can get water 
you know, for, you know, my daily needs or whatever, uh, the seawater to clean myself, or whatever. I'm just going to do that, you know, just so I don't have to keep going up and down getting water from them. So they did that. Uh, and then someone else saw, hey, you guys got a hole over here where you're able to get water. And we're going to try that. So I think we all can imagine what eventually happens. The ship starts sinking and the, the bottom quarters are filled with water. And, you know, the ship's mate and the others run downstairs like, what have you done? You know, and they're like, oh, it, it got out of control. We were just trying to uh, get water. Water, we were tired of going, you know, but now we're out at sea and the ship is sinking. And the analogy or metaphor here is we're all on the same ship. And although we're not all on the same level, when we have people in our society that we're tied to, you know, that are doing destructive behaviors, it's going to eventually affect us all. So just wanted to share that with you all. I hope I haven't wasted. Uh, too much of your uh, expectation or time. I'm still clicking, letting people in. So hopefully we're going to have a full house at some point. All right, let me get my new share together. What I did, like I said, I just wanted to keep it short and sweet and something that we could all uh, relate to. Um, I composed a pretty simplistic timeline, um, you know, after the formation of the original Africa town in Mobile, Alabama uh, in 1861, uh, they closed out the uh, century and the uh, reconstruction period and, 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 and all of that. And there was so much hope uh, for 1900, you know, uh, slavery had been abolished um, and, you know, like I said, there were uh, black politicians in the Senate, in Congress, uh, you know, as advisors and, and, and uh, representatives, you know, uh, and things were on the upswing and hopes were high that uh, finally uh, black people would be integrated into society in a productive and, and, and profitable and prosperous way. And so coming into the 1900s and escaping the 1800s where, you know, slavery had dominated more than half of the century, going into the 1900s as a free man, as a free woman, um, and, and as an upright human being able to uh, push forth in their own destiny. This was, uh, you know, a great period in time of hope. Um, also, it was uh, a time period where uh, the political uh, uh, infrastructure of America had really taken hold and embraced the African American um, as a uh, a real issue. You know, you had one side of the coin that said, "Hey, this is a danger. Uh, this is a, uh, a hindrance to you know our society that has to be controlled," uh, and another one that uh, simply said, "Hey." These are people and human beings just like us, uh, and they have goals just like us. Uh, maybe we can exploit that uh, uh, energy uh, and, and, and push forth, you know, some of our ideas and goals. Uh, two of the uh, leaders of the political thought process uh, were uh, A. Philip Randolph, um, who advised the president. Uh, he started the uh, Tuskegee Institute uh, and several other. He was the first uh, Black union unionist uh, that uh, organized a union for the rail cars. The porters on the rail cars were all African-American men, uh, and he organized a union uh, called the Sleeping Porter, uh, Sleeping Car Porters. Um, his philosophy was this. Uh, we don't need to have mainstream appeal, um, and we don't have to be uh, integrated. And it is better if we are not, because if the gains that we are making uh, financially, 
land-wise and otherwise are exposed to the mainstream, it could be detrimental to our movement, uh, our success, and overall our families. That was uh, his, his philosophy. So kind of like, uh, let's move forward and advance as a people, but let's do it under the radar. We don't need to be uh, sitting next to, you know, uh, the other citizens eating in restaurants and this, this and that, infuriating and, you know, inflaming tensions. You know, he pushed for more of a separate but equal uh, solution. Uh, he also was a uh, supporter of Marcus Garvey, who had a more of a back to Africa uh, philosophy, um, you know. So he was pitted or placed in direct opposition to another uh, African-American uh, intellectual and statesman that was W.E.B. Du Bois, who was more or less uh, the uh, founder of civil rights or the civil rights ideal and mentality, meaning we are going to force you uh, by any means to change the society to incorporate us and integrate us into your systems, into your schools, into your businesses. We are Americans, you're Americans. We're going to overcome this barrier of hate, uh, you know, through education and economic fortitude. So you had these two uh, opinions opposing each other. Um, and uh, let me get uh, another share together. Uh, oh, I didn't mean to do that. You know, at this point in time, you had uh, the largest uh, uh, push for land ownership by African Americans uh, in the history of the country. As soon as I can find it. Okay, here we go. And let's go there. Um, this is a graph. Um, I couldn't get the full graph uh, for 1900, but it, 1900 was the peak year uh, for Black ownership of land. Um, here the quote is 14 million acres. Uh, that's like a third of Washington state um, in private ownership by, uh, you know, black individuals and, and businesses. Um, also, uh, this was a uh, high level of uh, investment, productivity, uh, and black business. We hear the term black Wall Street um, and there were several of them throughout the uh, South and, and, and other regions, but it was a time of prosperity and Black self-sufficiency. And I'm sure you can see the graph, uh, how it just significantly declines uh, when we start getting into the 20s and the 30s. Um, this is the resurgence or the uh, hyper-implementation of the Jim Crow uh, era and its push against Black businesses uh, and Black ownership as the uh, Jim Crow philosophies invaded the government. Uh, the uh, people that owned this land, they were basically swindled out of the land or pushed out of the land due to technicalities. Some of their paperwork wasn't right um, as far as the new rules and laws that were being developed so far as land ownership and deeds and this, this, and that, and the other. Um, there were several uh, different uh, uh, methodologies in which the land was taken from them. Um, and you can see this steep decline all the way down year by year, day by day to the 80s, um, where you know it, it almost bottoms out. And this is not by accident. This is not because of, uh, not solely at this point uh, in the 19, early 1900s because of uh, any social ill that the African-Americans had engaged in, but this was systematic policy implemented by the government uh, 
just to uh, uh, strip power and land away from the African American community. Um, we had it all planned out, meaning all of us. We had the answer. Um, and that was, if you own land, because at this time at 1900, if you did not own land, you could not vote. Okay, this is before the uh, suffrage movement. Uh, and so uh, to vote or to participate in any political uh, uh, ventures, you had to be a landowner. So the uh, top black aspiration was to own land and a business and to be a productive, uh, uh, strong member of society. And as I said, uh, there were different uh, schemes and mechanisms put in place uh, by the United States government that uh, uh, severely hampered this. Um, so I've also enclosed uh, or will share uh, from the uh, some of the government websites in their own words what they're saying. Um, because their goal was to, uh, you know, like I said, strip power from the African American uh, voter base um, and create more of a dependency uh, than uh, self sufficiency. So when we see what we see today, we have to always re remember and realize it's not by accident, not at all. Um, Okay, Graham. Okay, no, you didn't yeah. Write. I just want to note we have about fifteen more minutes till we have a hard stop in case you all want okay. to reach all and you want to open it up for questions. Okay, all right. We'll move through it. Uh, as I said, we've got a pretty uh, basic uh, uh, timeline. And yeah, if you want to just time. take a few more minutes, Malachi, that is totally fine. Okay, no problem. No problem. Uh, moving into the sixties. Um. Again, the two uh, opposing philosophies of separate but equal and uh, civil inclusion bump heads again with uh, our two of our, our most prominent leaders and spokesmen, uh, Malcolm X and Martin Luther King. Um, and, you know, at this time in the 60s, uh, you know, there was a... Uh, I think, hold on. Yeah, you guys should be able to see it. Oops, sorry. Uh, the New Deal and other uh, discriminatory practices, as they call them, the U.S. Department of Agri Agriculture, uh, at this point in time, had basically swindled all of the land away from uh, African Americans. Um, in fact, uh, after the I, had a, I Have a Dream speech, uh, we have another speech from Dr. King. Uh, where he's condemning the Department of Agriculture and he's asking, you know, uh, when there's going to be some type of compensation. At the same time, uh, you know, the farmers, the white farmers were getting, uh, uh, you know, subsidized and just there was a tremendous land grab while we were being stripped of land and land being the basis of power uh, you know, in the political spectrum, uh, you know, this was a tremendous loss for us as a people. So uh, we know how that story ended up. And as I said, we don't need to re-traumatize or rehash or revisit uh, the end of either of these gentlemen, but just to be conscious of uh, the history of it and how it, what happened. 1980, 20 years later, so we've gone from 1900 to 1960, now we're at 1980, and we are basically depleted. Um, I've, uh, let me see here. I have uh, placed here a uh, icon or picture. I don't know if you all are familiar with them. Maybe you are, maybe you aren't. Uh, we've got uh, Mike Wallace and Louis Farrakhan. They had a great debate in the 80s over the uh, condition of black society and, and, and the overall condition of the people. Uh, and at this point in time, there was no black leadership. Black leadership had been killed and annihilated 
you know, in America. Um, and as a, a youth in the 80s, I can remember the other two gentlemen on the top. These were drug dealers. Uh, these were people in our neighborhood. And after the government had failed uh, and the leadership had failed, uh, the uh, crack epidemic was most uh, prolific. And this was kind of the nail in the coffin for the black community. After this, uh, there basically was none. With the 80s came the uh, invention or, or the uh, expansion of the police state for African-Americans, the so-called war on drugs, uh, which then again reclaimed all of the houses and property that were involved in the drug trade or could have been involved in the drug trade. Uh, one of the uh, documents oops, from the government, sorry, uh, was the city of Detroit. And they were talking about how much they were seizing. Uh, and in upwards of $12 billion a year annually was seized in the uh, crack e epidemic or drug trade from 1980 to the year 2000, which we'll, we'll go next. Um, does anybody know that guy in that picture right there? No, you don't. This is Easy E. Um, and I'm going to go out on a limb and say he is more influential than Martin Luther King or Malcolm X. And I say that, and I know people are going to say, well, no, that's impossible. No, no. But I say that because Easy E was what they call the godfather of gangster rap. So he was the one that, uh, told everybody to go sell crack and to start shooting people and to uh, live a lifestyle of crime. And this was adopted by countless other rappers. And he was a hero. And still, even to this day, they make movies about him. Uh, you see somebody walking downtown with their pants sagging down and this and this and that. It's because of him. But uh, the evidence shows that uh, he was backed by some very heavy individuals from the White House on down. BlackRock, Vanguard, uh, uh, Wagner, uh, music, um, the whole gangster rap thing. And it's all documented. Uh, so when we look outside and we see this crime or this, this explosion in crime and why it's not going anywhere, uh, it's, it's put here. It's engineered. It's not organic. It's not an accident. Um, I know we're limited on time, but... Uh, I'll just read something uh, from the Washington Post. Right now, three companies, Warner Records, Universal Music, and Sony Music control around 90% of the depiction of hip hop. At the same time, two companies, Core Civic, formerly CCA, Corrections Corporation of America, and GEO Group, own about almost all the prison beds in the United States, all the private prison beds in the United States. Uh, what connects the two in industries together? Vanguard and BlackRock on both of them and can, are controlling shareholders in them both. Uh, so these are the people that are creating this music and this imagery that have our society where it is. Lastly, finishing up, uh, this is the March on Washington, the first one. And in 2020, there was another March on Washington um, and, you know, uh, just looking at the picture again, saying a thousand words, we can see something. Uh, the men are almost non-existent in the 2020 March on Washington. Um, same procedure, same signs, same complaints. Everything is the same, except the men, where they at? Probably prison, not interested. Who knows? It's just something to say uh, when, you know, the uh, claim is made, hey, you guys need to step up and get in your community and do this and do that. Just something to uh, think about. So what can be done? Um, I'm going to try to move. Okay, I, I can do it. Let me see. Where do I do it? Okay. Okay. Oh, there it is. Get down. Okay. Name you. Go over here. 
what can be done? We have to cre create and strengthen log logical thought processes in the educational system, as opposed to the emotional reactions uh, to society's disparities. This is something that's not done uh, for African Americans. Uh, we have to encourage responsible Black youth leadership and community building incentive based programming, something also that is not really done. Uh, we need open opportunities for business and home ownership via lending and entrepreneurial training for both men and women. I was on the SBA's website and they had a great program. Only thing, it's only for women. And, you know, I understand that there's some uh, gender gap and, and gender-based discrimination, but it does not have the same impact on African-Americans as it did in the mainstream world as a whole. It has to be recognized and understood. Uh, lastly, we have to support uh, criminal justice reform. Uh, there's been a large cry or outcry for defunding the police, but the police are just an extension of the courts, uh, you know, which are an extension of the legislative bodies. And we have to reform the entire uh, infrastructure if we want to see real change. So um, I don't know if we've got time for, do we, do we meet the deadline? Uh, we've got about, what, five minutes, Graham? So yeah. uh, let's take a few questions. If, if you if you're if are you ready malachi is that does that seem yeah yes i'm definitely ready great and i'm sorry i had to Let's, rush the presentation yeah I'll be late uh, few points. it's um, all right go ahead chris uh thank you um <clears throat> thank you for the presentation i, I guess i just want to take um maybe a, a challenge or two in that the timeline that you presented i i think obviously is accurate and, and those dates are fine but if we're really, if there's an attempt to try to get us to all understand how we got to this point, then it travels all the way back to, and I wasn't here at the beginning of your um, presentation, I must admit, 1619. That if we don't take people back to 1619 to understand that when the white lion, the Portuguese um, ship that landed in uh, Jamestown, put the first enslaved folks there, and that the forefathers knew this. And at that point, it was intentional that the institution of slavery would become an institution of, of America. Mm -hmm. And then moving forward, this has a tremendous impact. Uh, the one thing that I will say that I, I, I'm a little shaken that I guess I didn't hear you talk about was the Clinton crime bill had the most devastating impact on um, the incarceration of Black people. In fact, the war on uh, drugs was nothing compared to the impact of that in the community. And every bit of research and graphs one can muster shows the dramatic difference between the two. Uh, that if we had to point to a point of legislation, that would be one. And I'm just wondering how you figure that into your, your timelines. Hey, Chris, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, I was kind of rushed and I didn't get to touch on everything. But in speaking about Bill Clinton himself, um, yes, the omnibus crime bill uh, was one of the heavier weights that uh, we've had to endure. Uh, also, the Biden crime bill uh, and several others uh, that came subsequently after that uh, have devastated the community. You know, as I, as I said, it wasn't a war on drugs, it was a war on Black people. Because if it was truly a war on drugs, there would have been a different approach for the Iran-Contra situation, uh, and they would have went after the source. You know, everybody understands that, hey, if I'm addicted or I'm trying to make a couple of bucks, I have nothing in comparison to somebody that's moving, you know, a, a shipment, you know, on, on, on some carrier into the uh, waters of the United States and unloading drugs. There's no comparison, but rarely do we see a bust on that level. Um, I did have, uh, in relationship to the situation with the gangster rap, uh, in, in regarding Bill Clinton. Uh, Bill Clinton came out in the 90s, and this is what he said. President Clinton asserted today that Calvin Klein ads depicting 
partially clad teenagers in sensual poses were outrageous and that it was wrong to manipulate those children. As a father of a 15 year old daughter, he said, he was partic particularly upset. He took reservation with the inferences to heroin and the children being uh, sexually exploited and the reflection that it could possibly uh, uh, impact the children negatively. At the same time, gangster rap is at its height. Mm -hmm. You know, this is the president of the United States going after a, 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 a blue jean and a cologne vendor as opposed to someone who is putting on MTV every day, go kill somebody, go sell some crap, shoot, rape, kill, beat, this, this, and that, and embedding it into our culture, you know, from the highest levels of Hollywood and the music industry and the mind control apparatus to go along with that on children. So he had this to say about someone just with some cologne ads, but nothing to say about gangster rap except go to jail. So, uh, yeah, Chris, uh, I hope, you know, I, I didn't touch on the 1600 um, date or the Pope issuing the verdict that uh, Black people had no souls, Africans had no souls, therefore they were fair game for slavery. Uh, and this is what fueled the slave trade. And we call it the slave trade, the uh, civil rights movement, this, that, and the other, and we're talking about four or 500 years. But actually, this has been a war. Anytime you go into someone's territory, kidnap people, exploit them, murder them, uh, these are acts of war. And so we've been at war for 500 years against a machine. Um, and I mean, that's just the reality. So I hope I touched on something and, and shared something with you as you shared with us, uh, Chris. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Um, Preston, you had your hand up. Do you have a Do you have a quick one? I I, I know we do not are not going to be able to uncover the the amount of information that 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 has you know obviously for the the length of time that that we are talking about. There's a lot to to unpack. Do you have a quick one, Preston? I have a question. It, it should be quick, but it should also kind of uh, stimulate discussion because I'm kind of interested in um, uh, kind of the, the answer. But um, um, uh, so, uh, Malachi, you, you had mentioned, you, you had made the connection about Easy -E being the most influential <laughs> individual, and for me, that that's uh, quite you know thought provoking and stimulating. Uh, you know, among my heroes are you know Marcus Garvey and Malcolm X, and you know, of course, Malcolm X is influenced by Marcus Garvey's. Uh, and, you know, uh, you know, black power philosophy and uh, Marcus Garvey among my most favorite quotes of Marcus Garvey is, you know, intelligence rules the world and ignorance carries its burden. Um, and you had mentioned, you know, gangster rap is kind of afflicting the community. And when I try to bring those discussions up, uh, you know, I, I get some kind of blowback. And I, I wonder, you know, within, you know, African town and, uh, and other community, uh, other groups that are affiliated with Africa town, um, what you just Kind of shared is that kind of a viewpoint uh, shared amongst other uh, groups? Uh, is that becoming more popular? Because I, I would love to know. I would love to be a part of that conversation. Well, it's a touchy subject because are you attacking my culture or are you attacking what's wrong with my culture? And why are you talking anything about my culture? You know, we have that that type of those 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 viewpoints that are circulating. Um, and you know, I love Marcus Garvey. I love Malcolm X. I love uh, Dr. King. But you'll be hard pressed to walk down the street and find somebody dressed like Dr. King mm -hmm. or, or, or singing lyrics uh, or, or reciting speeches from Malcolm X or, or playing tapes or, or, or CDs or, right. or streaming them. But, you know, just two years ago, there was a movie straight out of Compton, uh, you know, related to Easy e and all of these gangster rappers, you know, he was the one that showed them, hey, you can get money cursing on the album. And don't get me wrong, I'm an Easy E fan. <laughs> I mean, that's the oxymoronic part of it. It was great music when I was 16, 17, 18. As a father, you know, as someone in the community that's dealing with gun violence, you know, uh, and, and, and listening, you know, at what level do we say, hey, this is irresponsible? Right. And then the the what I wanted to show is the white community will not have it. 
You know, they did not have it during the formative years of this generation. They would not allow it. The yeah. president of the United States had to come out and say, hey, wait a minute. I, I think we need to broaden that discussion because I, I bring it up also because Eric Adams had mentioned something about, you know, like uh, he's kind of against this trail rap, you know, talking about uh, uh, shooting people and raping people. And then a, an academic whom I respect, Melissa Harris Perry, who's on MS, NBC and all that, um, criticized Eric Adams. So, but it's refreshing to hear you say that. And uh, I definitely want to continue that conversation. Well, it's something that needs to be uh, expanded and expounded on. And I'm, I'm definitely uh, needing to do that because it, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, the only thing that impresses me is results. And mm -hmm. when we look at, you know, uh, 30 years of gangster rap and what it's done to our community, we can't say it's positive. Yeah. You know, we can. I appreciate you. Hey, right on, man. I'm glad I could have answered the question and even heard that, that you had that as a question. Some people would won't even say that. Um, Malachi, I I would like to find, I mean, it seems like if we have some interest, and I think we might even have some questions that are still coming here. Um, I would love to find a way to continue this mm -hmm. uh, with our membership, um, especially there might even be folks who were not able to be here tonight who might want to also be involved and participate in conversation. Um, ah, and from other, uh, from other LDs I'm seeing in the chat here, Barbara Oakrock, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, so uh, what I would love to do is uh, just after tonight that we can just maybe find some way to create a, a future conversation, a discussion, just some kind of a get together where we can have you just maybe a, a little more time to unpack some of these uh, discussion points that are really important and valuable to hear and listen to and be be involved with. So okay. um, not a problem at all. Sorry. Great, like, great. Not a That's problem fantastic. At all. We need to have this dialogue. We need That's to have right. these conversations. And I, the more of these conversations that take place, the less of the outside negative influence that has taken us nowhere but in this cyclical you know, a uh, uh, place of, of just no result, nothing changing, and us just all being debilitated by our society just being destroyed, you know, and, and exploited by, you know, uh, racial infighting. It's no reason. We've already solved these problems. You know, they've been solved since the 1900s. It's just the implementation of the solution that we're lacking by enough individuals that can scream over the uh, uh, the pundits and the rest of them that excite this type of rhetoric and 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 hatred and and just you know uh, uh, overall loss. Yeah. So yeah, I'm definitely down, and I'm I'm glad, and I'm sorry, you know, that we didn't have more time or that I didn't yeah. present faster or whatever. No, no, no. Definitely not, love to come back. It's not anything you did. It's literally that sixty minutes is just not sufficient time to really get get into some of these important uh, issues to, to think about and talk about. So Malachi, Kane, thank you so much for being here. Thank you everybody so much for, for joining us for this really important conversation. And uh, I, I, I pledge that we will continue this. So thanks again, Malachi. Thank everybody, you for having hands, me. hands in the air. And we can just say thank you to Malachi. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you. For thank you. Me. Thank Bye. you. Yes. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, really appreciate and grateful for your time this evening. Um, why don't we take a just a two minute reset break, um, and then we'll come back um, and start our meeting. Hey.